Hi everybody, welcome back to Take 5 with the Prez here at Blackburn College. I'm very excited today that we have Dr. Laura Weedlocker, Professor <laughs> of Political Science here. How are you doing, Laura? Well, how are you? Thank you for joining me here at beautiful Boswell Auditorium. Yeah, it's lovely For a great here. conversation. And I'm going to get us started. I get the first question. It's okay. sort of the host prerogative here. And, mm -hmm. and just for background's sake, I'd like to hear a little bit about your first car. My first car? Yeah. So I am the oldest of four. Okay. And so I got to do a lot of the firsts. My parents sometimes were a little, you know, you you try things out on the first child, and right, you're like, sure. okay, we're not going to do that with the second, right. third, fourth. Uh, I was inducted to the National Honor Society a year early, mm -hmm. and my father was so proud. I showed up from school, came home on a Friday, and there was a car in the driveway. He said, I'm so proud of you for being in the National Honor Society. I got you a car. I was like, that's great, Dad. It was a red Ford Pimpo. Pimpo Tempo, I think that's what I called it. Yeah, I think that's right. That's awesome. Yeah. And then I was like, this is so awesome. I have my freedom. And he responded, yeah, except your curfew is still 11. Your car has an 8.30 curfew. So you and your car have different curfews. Strings on a free car, though. I live with that. That's yeah. all right. That car was great. We, got, we had some good times. That is great. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. I can't, yeah, I'm kind of curious. What was your first car? Well, my first car I got in college. My parents always swore they would never buy us a car. And they wow. never did. Okay. Uh, and so my last year of college, I became an RA. And my parents said that the money they would have spent on my room and board, they gave to me to buy a car. So okay. I went out with $5,000 and bought a car. And so they did help me, in, in a, certainly in a way. Yeah. But I also felt like I entered in all that stuff. And so I didn't get a car until my last year of college. Wow. You, were, you, you had all these benefits growing up. It's good stuff. Oh, yeah. I was, I was pretty lucky in a lot of ways. So we already have this debate in my house, but we're a few years away from kids <laughs> demanding cars, and I said, oh, they got to earn a car. Yeah, I'm down for that. Okay, Totally that down with that. To yeah. Also, my last kid's last one to have a cell phone. I mean, no one else, everyone else has a cell phone but my kids. How old is the oldest? Eleven. Eleven. I feel like that is, that's okay. Yeah, no, we're hanging on. This I'm holding important. out for 13. 13's fair. 13's fair. I'm, I think 13. that does make sense. At a certain point, they're out, you want to know where they are. All right, so, okay, are you going to buy their first cell phone, or are you going to make them save up and buy it? 13, yeah, I'm probably going to. I don't know. It's a few years away. We'll see. Okay. We'll see. Okay. All right, so on to the next question. Okay, so. Oh, I'm sorry. Feel, no, no, I guess I was a tag on to yours. But I, I, okay, I have a burning question. All right. I need to know, how big of an Olympics fan are you? Uh, I'm mild. I enjoy it, but I don't okay. really seek it out. Okay, so you don't watch like opening to closing ceremonies as much Olympics as possible. We watch the opening ceremony as a family, okay. but we have not watched a lot of it since. Okay. Is that is that bad? No, it's not bad. I mean, um, okay. It's it's okay. So. And I'm more I, like watching like who Mike Pence applauds for and who doesn't. You know, I mean, like I'm watching for the political <laughs> angle. And the whole thing. Okay. See, I I definitely watch the Olympics, and it's I I get to live out alternative fantasies because I always wanted to be really athletic, but I'm not very coordinated. So when the Olympics comes on, this is my chance to like um, I could have been that. What could have been? Yeah. So my question to you is, okay. if you could be in any Olympic sport, what would oh. it be? Any Olympic sport? I think we should limit it to winter since it's the Winter Games right now. Yeah, the Winter Games. I really think ski jumping is awesome. Yeah. I mean, they come down, it's like taller than the Statue of Liberty. Yeah. And they come down that thing and go, and on TV it looks like they are way up there flying. Yeah. And I read about those athletes try to intentionally stay jet lagged so really? that there's a little sort of fog in them because if you were totally alert and conscious, you would never do this. <laughs> and so you need that little fog, and that's yeah. like an edge is to just be jet lagged. And I'm like, just enough. That's, I don't think I could do it. But the idea that, like, if, if I could pull that off, mm -hmm. awesome. that would be really cool. That would be cool. Be so, cool. being a professional polit professor of political science, I have a political sciencey kind of a question. Okay. Are you ready? Fun. Are you ready yeah. Geek out political science. A classes? little bit ready. Yeah, we'll see. Okay. Also terrified because what if I don't know it? Then I look like no. It's a an dummy. opinion question. It's an opinion question. Oh, okay. There's okay. no wrong answer to this. Okay. Perfect. Unless you run for office someday, in which case you'll be held accountable for this answer. <laughs> so, if you could uh, go back and either advise the founding fathers mm. or tweak something about our federal government system. You yeah. know, the electoral college or filibusters or whatever. You think this doesn't, we, we would be better off without that. What, okay. what would you change? I would have made him answer the slavery question. Okay. Like that was one they just punted on. 
and then we still have like we're still dealing with it. The original sin of the founding of the country. That, yeah, you know, we're still like and the three fifths of them that tells you they were clearly aware. So this is a concern, and there were people right. who were like, "Here's our opportunity just to like make a clean break." Yeah, and they're like, they, they probably could not have formed the union completely because the South would have walked away. So I get why politically it wasn't the right time, but if I could have been in the room and like, like well, here's how this plays out. Yeah, that's a good answer. And it was before the cotton gin was invented, so we weren't as reliant on the South on slavery yet. So if there was right. a moment that might have been it. And Maybe. That was a problem. Maybe. Things could have been so much different. Yeah, that's true. So when I was hired in, and I was all jazzed to teach American politics, statistics, and then I got here, and they're like, oh, guess what? You get to do some leadership, Surprise. too. Surprise. <laughs> I was like, oh, OK. Yeah. So I've had very little like formal theory-based philosophy of leadership, all of that. And I've, you know, I've learned a lot, and it's been fascinating. But then you, as a president of a college, this is, this is your every day. You're living it. So I was curious what your leadership philosophy is. Do you see yourself as an inspirational leader, or transformational? Servant leader, where do you think you fit in there? Well, you know the theory better than I know the theory, so I don't okay. have the right theoretical answer here. And also, it's how I view myself, and so I'm not sure how accurate my own <laughs> view of myself okay. is. Right? I might think of myself in a certain <laughs> way, but I'm not that at all. Who okay. knows? Um, I, I, I like to, to I, I learned a lot from several mentors before who sort of did a great job, I thought of defining the visionary reason for the mm. organization's existence. And at Blackburn College, and especially with the work program, that's all about access and affordability to higher education. We're trying to do something different, unique, and special. Yeah. And if you use that as a rallying cry, I think that does provide some motivation for students, faculty, staff, donors, board of trustees, every constituency group I'm talking to. I feel like I'm constantly repeating myself, like mm -hmm. I'm giving more or less the same speech every time. Maybe that's true. but. I think it's that repeating why we're here thing that motivates people to action. Because yeah. you're dealing with a group of people, especially in the faculty and staff, no one went into this for the money, right? No one's here to get rich. Oh. You're here because you wanted you when you're here to get rich. That's fine. The money good, is nice. Good luck with that. Um, so you're, you're in nonprofit work because you want to make the world a little better place. Yeah. And so you got to remind people of what that's about here as a way to keep people moving forward. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to do. Whether it works or not is a different issue. I don't know. I think time has to be the judge. It's hard to know in the moment. It's hard to know in the moment. Yeah, you, can, you can never judge yourself. There's but you don't wake up and just and are like, today I will be transformational. No, or today I, don't. I will be inspirational. The, the leadership book on the side of my bed, I don't, yeah. <laughs> on Tuesdays, I will be this. No, that's, yeah. Okay. It is what it is. Okay. So, speaking of Blackburn College and what makes us so special, mm -hmm. you know, there's lots of political science departments out there, and professors, and lots of people that love social stats like you, yeah. for reasons we can talk about later. Um, and, and so, like, if, if students are out looking at all these options, why choose Blackburn? What are they going to get with, with you as a teacher that they're not going to go to other places? Hmm. I think that this is one of those questions that, I mean, when I was on the job market and I was looking for a place and trying to think what is reasonable, I was looking at, a, at schools in a very practical sense. I knew that I wasn't going to move very far. I needed to be somewhere where I could, you know, get to come back. And I kind of look at all these lists as uh, in a very practical way, which is also how I picked a college. Which, if I had to go back, I would make those decisions very differently. Sure. I'm actually quite taken with the students who are very carefully considering, like, does this school fit with me? Yeah, like, yeah. can I see myself here? I was definitely taken off, like, price, is air conditioning, are the guys cute? Like, I had a very <laughs> different list. Very immature picking colleges. Um, and when I came to Blackburn, even for the first time that I was here, there was just there was something different here. And I felt in some ways that I had been at this school for a long time already. Like the students felt very, I felt very comfortable with the students. I felt very comfortable um, with my interactions with what would become my peers. And when I talk to my peers who teach at other places, like there is parts of them that are like, wow, that does sound cool like that. I would like to do that. Um, I feel that I am working with students so like, th that was me. I know it feels like a long time ago, but, but that was me. I was a first generation student. My parents were very overwhelmed by the process of going to school. And they basically said, you know, you're real smart. You have a car. You can't leave the state. Figure it out. Right. <laughs> that was all the instruction <laughs> that I got. 
Um, and I remember that. So when new students' perspectives come in and I meet their parents, uh, I, get, I, get a, I remember what it was like to sit in that chair and to feel scared and overwhelmed. And when I teach my introductory classes that are mostly freshmen, I remember being one of those students sitting in that seat and feeling a little overwhelmed, a little freaked out, but also like really keen to, to do well. Um, and I just, I don't know, there's just something here that wasn't anywhere else that, that I have looked. And so I really enjoy being able to establish personal connections with students. I feel like I get to mentor students. I feel like I get to develop a rapport with students that I personally didn't get until I was in graduate school. And, you know, Shelly and I were remarking the other day, like, when we write letters for students for graduate school, they're not generic. They're very personal because we have stories about them. They work for us. We've had them in class. We've had experience with, the, with them. But we can really get into detail, like, this is why the student is, is, is exceptional and worthy to be considered for your program. And that, that is really cool. It's really satisfying. It is good. Yeah, I think yeah. there's a common thread around here that people don't think of themselves as filters trying to weed out the unworthy students with yeah. all the pumps trying to help them achieve the next level. And we've all been there. So yeah. That's cool. Yeah, and it's like the fountain of youth. It is. So, being around young people all the time. We keep getting you older. They keep staying the same age. It's amazing. Yeah, I don't feel like I'm getting you're older. You're not getting older. No. I'm getting older, and I'm very aware of that fact, but <laughs> I'm glad you're not. I'm delusioned, and that's okay. I'm happy to be <laughs> in that place where I'm like, yeah, you guys have just beaten off of you. You're all hip to what's cool, and I try out phrases and things, and they, they tell me, like, no, you can't say that. You're too old. Yeah, yeah. They, they know all about the interwebs and all that stuff. Yeah. Right. What do we know? Right. Yeah. Uh, okay, so my next question for you. What Hollywood actor would play you in the movie of your life? Well, uh, I'm going to go, okay. So we were saying before how you're not getting older and I am. In my mind, I'm like 58 years old. Like, really? I just think that's like the ideal age. Okay. And so I think the actor that carries it off best is like a George Clooney, like mm -hmm. a salt and pepper, yeah. like, you know, still hip and cool, but not a kid okay. anymore kind of a thing. And not that I'm as, you know, together as George Clooney appears to be on screen. I assume he's a mess in real life. Who knows? But on screen, yeah. he comes off very well and together yeah. and all that stuff. So sure, why not? I'll okay. love you, George Clooney. All right, so um, eight-year-old, 10-year-old Laura mm -hmm. Busby. Yeah has dreams, has oh aspirations, goodness. is going to do some stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure uh, being professor of political science was maybe not on the top of that <laughs> list at that time. No. I, you know, it, you, it, it's, it's, it's great, and you, you've grown into that, and that's wonderful. But, you know, what do you think that 8- or 10-year-old version of yourself would, would like about your current situation, hmm. or be like, come on, Laura, what are you doing? Come on. Oh, that's a good question. So the 8- to 10-year-old version of me yeah. is not that much different from from this, this version before us. Okay, good, good. Uh, I was an overly earnest child. <laughs> Took everything <laughs> very seriously. It was incredibly sincere. Uh, no I, statistics from the beginning, right? No. It was very exciting. No, I, I thought math was really boring. Okay. I was not interested. I was not a good math student. Uh, so, for example, I, for a while, thought, like, it would be so cool to be an illustrator. Mm -hmm. And... We had a huge family garden. I'd want every evening in this, from the time that things were ready to be picked until the garden was put to bed for winter, the family would go out and in the, in the calm of the evening, before it was dark, we would pick whatever was, was ready to be picked. And so it was often a time that we would check in with each other, have conversation. Mm -hmm. And my mother was the, the town florist and she shared the story uh, that she had, I mean, in a small town, you often had very interesting floral deliveries. And so sometimes there would be funny stories about, you know, the delivery that went wrong or the delivery that was like really emotional and sweet. And so she shared this story about delivering flowers to this woman who was an artist and I had, who lived behind the high school. And it's a small town. I was like, how, how have I missed this? I have no idea. And not only had the art, the, was there a famous, locally famous watercolor artist who lived really close, she had lived in our house because our house was really old. Uh -huh. And my mom was just like, isn't that so cool? I was like, it is so cool. But I felt this sense of like, I have to do something about this. Okay. Like, here is my moment. I could be an illustrator and there's an artist who lives like in my town. I have to go. So the next day I got on my bike and I just cold called this woman. Like, 
rode my bike to her house, knocked on the door, and she was incredibly gracious and kind. Um, She was like, actually, I do need help. It's not with any of my work, but I have this giant artistic, like, floral bed that has sculpture in it that needs weeding and I have terrible arthritis in my hands I can't weed my garden okay. I was like I'll do anything <laughs> so I would weed her garden and we would talk about art and it was oh know, that's awesome it was really charming and then later I kind of learned like oh like this, these aren't my natural skill sets so we let that dream but go still, but, for but a still have a relationship with someone like that yeah she you was you put yourself out there and sort of cold call or knock on the door or whatever you did that's yeah. remarkable she was in her mid 50s Almost 60 at that time. Yeah. yeah, we were we became really good friends. Uh, my next question for you has to do with, it's a good what if. Okay. So let's okay. pretend, I don't know who your best friend is. Okay, got it. If they're, even if they're remotely qualified, but I feel like times are different. Okay. So let's pretend your best friend becomes the president. Okay, got it. Calls you up and says, John? Yes. This is his phone. John? Yes. I, I need you on my team. Okay. You can have... Any appointed position that you want, what is it? Uh, press secretary. Press secretary? Absolutely. Really? Which is an insane answer, I realize, because it's the <laughs> toughest job, I think. But I. What? You think press secretary is the toughest job? Well, yeah, to face the press corps every day. Oh, they're not that bad. It's a game of gotcha and cat and mouse. I watch it, and don't get me wrong, not all press secretaries are created equal here, right? <laughs> there are good examples yeah. and bad examples, yeah. but the ones that are good at it, that have this relationship, of sort of mutual respect, but also sort of, I admire the thinking on their feet. Mm-hmm. You know, they're getting tossed these uh, really tough questions and they didn't even think about it beforehand and they right. come up with these very sharp answers. Yeah. Just the challenge of sort of going into that every day. Yeah. yeah. I've always thought like, if, if I had a chance to be press secretary, that would be okay. a lot of fun. I know it's not the policy role and all that sort of stuff. You know, I should say in secretary of education, but who pays <laughs> attention to secretary of education, right? Uh, no offense, Betsy. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, the, you know, the press secretary would just be a lot of fun. So yeah. that's what I would do. Okay, that's whatever, awesome. You know, if the president calls you, you, you say, well, how can I be of service? And wherever he or she would need me, that's what I would do. Oh, that's very classy. I know classy. that's the better, that's the better, classier that's answer. Classy. But it's your best friend. You don't have to be like that with your best friend. I think, you know, the president job is a hard job. Especially yeah. if it's your best friend, you have to be like, listen, I'll do whatever you need me to do. Oh, that's very, that's okay. very classy. This could happen. That's good. This, this could absolutely happen. So, Laura, yes. what's the last show you really got into and sort of just binge watched? You were just all about this. Mm. Had your little Netflix weekend. Um, Stranger Things. I'm totally just starting this right now. Are I'm, you really? I'm like five in. It's... We just went to the Upside Down. Yes, it's very okay. exciting. And don't ruin what happens next, but yes, I, I can won't. totally understand this. But I have to confess, I don't like to be afraid. Yeah. I, I don't do scary. I don't do horror life is hard enough yeah. and I'm already like an overly earnest person. Like when I watch TV, I need levity. So I completely avoided Stranger Things. It was too intense. Sure. I would go upstairs, partner would watch it. Yeah. And then before the second season launched, he wanted to rewatch the final episode of the first sure. season. And I want to share this experience together. That's right. Thing to do. He started it. I was still on the couch. I was 10 minutes in and I couldn't look away. I was like, this is what? And I oh, kept yeah. asking, what happens? Yeah. Or why is it? And he yeah. was like, okay, it's fine. And he stopped. We, we went back and yeah. we watched him. Yeah, it's rare that I find a show that actually gets my whole attention. Like, I'm usually yes. playing with my phone or doing something or whatever. Mm. But this one, I'm like glued to it. It's good stuff. The acting's good incredible. Choice. Yes. It's incredible. Especially with the kids and stuff. Yes. Yeah. I, I think it's Winona Ryder's one of her best. She is mm-hmm. all in. Yeah. It makes it so believable. stars to be in the 80s show. I, That's so, great. A little older. Yeah. And it feels so, so familiar. I'm just, I was blown away by yeah. the the quality yeah. like, I feel like I'm in the 80s yeah it's and it awesome. looks familiar probably to folks around our ages or whatever it's yeah. like yeah that was sort of like our house that's and that spot was sort on. of like our TV and yep. that was yep that's about it yeah so if you see the Wienermobile yes do you take a picture I do is it I, a selfie it is not it is not I find selfies annoying <gasps> how do you know you were there oh why does anyone care that I'm there <laughs> I, I, okay. For posterity. I, I understand selfies in group situations. Okay. And you and I have been in several of those where we need to document yeah. or It's just a group picture. Right. Group pictures make perfect sense. Right. But if I'm alone on a business trip in Phoenix and there's the Wiener Reveal in a parking lot, 
I might take a picture. I'll probably take a picture of it, show yeah. the kids or whatever. I might even think about posting to Twitter or whatever. Hey, cool, I found the Wienermobile. Yeah. Does anyone need to see my ugly face in front of the Wienermobile, especially at that angle? And I don't get the need for people to do this thing. I just okay. don't get selfies. So let, no, I would take a picture, but no selfies. Let me explain to you the importance of putting yourself in pictures. Okay. You know about the montage. Uh, at the funeral? They're at, they're at funerals, they're at weddings, they're at graduation parties. Someday you're going to retire and there will be a montage. And in the montage of your life, you want good photos. Like, and you need a lot to choose from. Oh, in my wake, I just hope there's good beer. I don't think that, you know, everyone should You don't have a experience. choice. There's going to be a montage. It is now a thing. Plan. I don't know. It's now a thing that happens. You know what the thing is? When, when you and I, many years from now, do pass on, yeah. our kids will be stuck with bajillions of pictures <laughs> to sort through yeah. to get anywhere close to a montage because our lives are documented every yeah. five minutes we have to take a picture of something and we don't need to add any more to it. I'm unconvinced. Wow. No selfies from me. Okay. Alright everybody, with that note, no selfies from me. We're happy to end <laughs> this, this next episode of Take Five with Prez. We'll see you next time.